Uh, good morning. I've got the energy task of opening today um, uh, with a topic that hopefully will really interest you. It certainly interests me. This is the reason I'm talking about it today. And it's the reason I've had my head in it for like the last 12 months, literally living this, wearing the T-shirt <laughs> uh, and using it uh, extensively. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is how Google have been managing their data center for the last 10 years and how it's actually now open to us all. It's literally open source. Uh, so we can actually use all of the good things that they have uh, in our own infrastructure. Um, I'm from Jetstack. Um, we are a container infrastructure company. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, as we go through. Okay, I think it's fair to say that software is becoming increasingly complex for lots of different reasons. We're building from multiple form factors, and some people are talking about mobile today. We've got lots and lots of different software stacks. It seems like there's almost like every week when you can hit GitHub and sort of discover a new software framework to use and someone's mentioning to you something that you've not heard of before. Um, lots of languages, lots of new generation database engines. I, I was at MongoDB for several years and you know, a lot of people were moving over to these new Fandango kind of database engines, not always using the, the main state, but also beginning to think about how they need to actually use the right tools for the right job. Scale and resilience is a, is a, is a big thing. So everything is about scale. Yeah. We want to be able to go from very small to the very large very quickly, but importantly, make sure this is all kind of resilient. And cloud has been an incredible driver for this. Now we can spin up instances in the cloud, and I'm hoping mine will work today. Um, and we can actually uh, go have that scale, have that resilience, um, all really at the top of the button, and actually at really, really very low cost uh, as well. And the problem is we've got issues. This is, this is not actually incredibly easy. So one of the things that we've seen is the rise of something called microservices. Who, who here has heard of microservices? This, you've, got, you've got to have heard of it. Yeah, it's, it's the buzzword of, the, of probably the last 12 months. Um, this is all about effectively having small, well-defined, well-connected services that do one thing and do that one thing very, very well. So rather than having the big monolith, what you actually have are these small microservices um, independently deployable with their own life release cycle, tend to have an actual team that kind of covers the entire life cycle of that um, with complete responsibility for it. So not only do you develop it, but you also support it uh, as well. Polygot persistence, so this is all about making sure that you, know, you use the right tool for the right job. As I said, you, know, you use a graph database, or perhaps a document database, or perhaps even a wide column store if that suits. Um, and it's all automated, heavily automated. You know, now we've got more and more services, but what we don't want to have to keep doing is having to go back to the ops team to keep asking for another VM, another VM, another VM. And that's actually what happens in the Microsoft world if we're not careful. And lots of testing. Like, we want to be able to test, and we want to test often uh, as well. So this has kind of given rise to something called containers, or at least this is certainly starting to see interest in containers. Who here has heard of containers? Wow. <laughs> it's impressive. OK, I'm not surprised. Um, so effectively, containers have been around a long, long time. I mean, they've been around in the Linux kernel for quite a long time. They've had things like C groups and namespaces built into the kernel, and people have been using them for a long time. It turns out, though, they've actually now been popularized by Docker. And who here, here is Docker? Heard of Docker? Using, using Docker? Quite a few people as well. So what you get from a container is it actually being very, very lightweight. So go from the world we're in at the moment, where actually if you were to take a very large computer and spill it up, you typically use virtualization. And here, everyone here probably uses a VM uh, in a cloud environment. What, what does that look like? Well, we're running a, a guest OS, um, we have a hypervisor, and we have uh, a kernel baked into each of these, of course. We actually have a whole operating system with complete isolation and separation. That's, that's kind of all good, but the problem is, we've got this kernel that we're replicating every single time which is actually pretty unnecessary, when in fact, what we could do with something like a container is we could actually just have a single kernel. That doesn't need to change. That's exactly the same throughout. And actually just have something that sits over the very top of it that's then able to make the appropriate cores into it. So what we get with a container is something that's incredibly lightweight. And you actually, some of the containers I use typically tens of megabytes, hundreds of megabytes, are very, very small. Why? Because they're just the user space, not the kernel just the user space, so it's just my application, together with all of the things that I need to use. And that will make the syscalls to the kernel in the same, exactly the same way. It's portable, so I can take my container and run it anywhere. Anywhere there's Linux at the moment. Um, that's the back end to Docker engine. So I can take it and I can run it in anywhere. A few dependencies on the kernel, right? If I'm using something very specific, of course I need to have the right kernel. But I can move it around, and that's really, really useful. I can put something into AWS, 
I can be happy with the bill I'm paying with AWS. But then if G Google Compute Engine comes along and says, well, I can have your bill, move to us. Oh, I can pick up my Docker container and move it across. At least that's the idea. And it works generally very well. I get isolation between processes. So if I wanted to run many processes on my VM, typically they would all be, I mean, they might be in separate VMs, but then I get the problem of them kind of being sort of using up too much resource. So what I get with the isolation is the ability to take the process and give it this, its own view of the world, effectively. We'll discover a bit more about this. And we get consistency as well. So I can be pretty sure that when I build my container on my laptop, that it's going to look pretty much exactly the same uh, that it does uh, when I put it into production. And that's really, really quite useful because there's so many times when you've kind of built code and then it doesn't work somewhere else. That happens, seems to happen all the time. So containers, not surprisingly, have become very, very popular and Docker has become a very, very big company. I think it's valued at over a billion dollars. So that's probably what we, everyone's kind of pretty familiar with. It actually happens, as I said, that they've taken something that already existed and what they've done is put an API, a very nice API at the top of it, uh, and the CLI so that we can use it, and an image format so we can sort of begin to describe what our container looks like. All very, very good. So as I said, we get an isolated system on top of a Linux OS. We get our own network. We get our own file system that's completely separate. Um, we can resor li limit resources. So I can sort of say, actually, my container needs to run, but it only needs to run with a core, and it only needs to run with tens of megabytes, hundreds of megabytes. And we're very specific about what it can do. And the Linux kernel will make that resource enforcement. It's immutable, so the idea is that I don't change it. I don't make tweaks to it. I don't SSH to it. Um, who's here, who here has heard of a mutable infrastructure? So a few of you have. So this is kind of idea that I build something, build it once, and then if I want to make a change, I build it again, and then I push it back. Uh, and it runs everywhere. There's a Docker daemon, and under the bonnet, you've got something called a layered file system. I'm not going to focus too much here on that, but if you haven't read about it, please do, because it's really interesting. But the problem is, if we're to take microservices and we're to take containers, all good things, um, and put them into production, we've got, we've got a problem because probably what we've now got are lots and lots of containers. You know, you might start with maybe just the tens of containers, but you imagine where in a microservice, typical microservices architecture, you might have sort of hundreds of these services. It gets pretty complex pretty quickly. Why? Because you've got to manage these things. You know, having to hand crank all these rules to actually manage it is hard. So you've got the problem of orchestration and scheduling. Okay, so I've got lots of these things. I think this photo probably depicts it pretty well. I've got all of these things, like where are they? What are they? How do I move them? It's really, really quite tricky. Well, actually, people who have been doing real containers have had this exact problem as well. It's really interesting, the parallels between the two. Scheduling is nothing I'll come on to. And also monitoring, like what, what are these things doing? You know, what, what are they actually doing? Um, and how can I use that potentially to make better scheduling decisions? You know, when I'm going to need to put something somewhere else, can I kind of use resources to kind of give me that indication? Network and storage, these are all really tricky ones as well. In my container world, ideally I want to be able to talk to my container, so I need it to be network addressable. So I need lots and lots of IPs. <laughs> and we're already out of IPv4, IPv6 is well coming. Um, so this, is, this, is, this presents a challenge as well, and we'll talk, we'll talk more about this. Um, and storage as well. So I need to be able to attach volumes, right? I need to be able to attach data to my containers. I need to be able to do things with them. The containers are mutable, but I need mutability on a volume somewhere. So that's kind of hard because I've got containers which come up and come down, or ephemeral, and I need to be able to attach something that's non-ephemeral. And the guys at Cluster HQ, who I, we work closely with, they are tackling this problem uh, and tackling it very, very well indeed. So containers at Google, OK, what's happened having there? Well, Google have actually been using containers for over a decade. Uh, they actually looked at this problem sort of pre-VM. So virtualization wasn't really even around at the time. And what they actually saw was the ability to do virtualization in the kernel. And they took it, they made many, many contributions. So if you look back at something called LXC, which is basically underpins Docker, if you look at that, what you will actually see are loads of contributions from Google, loads of contributions from lots of tech companies, in fairness, but particularly from Google, and they've had a number of very good projects. So they took this, and what they built on top of it is a container cluster manager. So they were trying to tackle these problems. How do I, how do I actually take all of those good containers and all of the benefits of containers and put them into an environment that's highly automated? And if you probably saw the photo at the beginning of the, the presentation. That's actually one of Google's data centers, which they've kind of opened. You know, you can sort of have a read about it. I think they're really quite proud of it. Um, 
it's pretty awesome, the size of these things. I mean, you're talking about tens of thousands of machines in a single cell, <laughs> uh, and there's many, many cells worldwide. So they built something called uh, Borg, uh, Google Borg. It's a completely open paper. Um, this is what's, I think, pretty great about Google. They actually publish all their research. And if you look at the things that they've done, they've, what, they've done MapReduce, they've done Chubby, they've done, uh, they've done some of the other, uh, lots of papers around which have actually formed some of the technologies that we now use today. This is yet another really great technology that they've open sourced. Have a read of the paper, it's reasonably heavy going, but it's actually really interesting. Um, it's, and it's worth getting that grounding for kind of understanding Google's problem. Admittedly, Google's problem is not our problem. We don't have that scale problem. But actually, some of the challenges that they had are actually some of the challenges that we all have in some way. So take a, take a read of the paper. Here's the link. I'll make my slides available so you can actually click the link as well. Um, they launch everything in a container. It's pretty amazing. Everything. I mean, so you hit Gmail today, you hit Google Drive. Everything sits um, on a container. And they run about 2 billion of them. They're, they're really proud of the numbers. Um, 2 billion of these things get launched uh, just a week, which is pretty amazing. And also, it's the very fact that you get lots of different types of workloads. So at the moment, everyone thinks about running a container for maybe something that's just a web app. They don't think about databases. They don't think about um, even file systems. Well, absolutely everything uh, is built in a container. So take a read of it. The great thing is, though, this is, um, this is kind of informed an open source project. So based on all of this experience, Google have said, well, and actually seeing the rise of Docker, they've seen, actually, everyone's now using a container. No, we were using them for a decade, but actually now everyone's using them. So perhaps we should really give something back to the community and say, do you know what? All of our research, all of our experience has told us you should do it this way. So they've open sourced this thing called Kubernetes. And if you're wondering how it's pronounced, it's there. Click the link, and it's Brendan Burns, who's the kind of godfather of Kubernetes. He sort of pronounces it for you just to make sure you get it right. Uh, effectively, it's Greek. So if anyone's Greek, they probably just told me it's the wrong pronunciation. Um, but sometimes it gets, gets called KATS if you ever saw it, um, or K it's if you've ever seen it. But effectively, what it is is it's a container cluster manager, and it runs absolutely anywhere. So today I'm going to be running it on my laptop. Um, perhaps it might run in the cloud. We'll see uh, on Core OS in, in AWS. Um, the idea being that it's actually very lightweight. It can be used absolutely anywhere. You could use it across cloud providers, perhaps, on bare metal, on VMs, doesn't matter. It builds on all this experience. So Borg is the open source paper that they wrote. So what they've used, they've learned the lessons of Borg. They've learned the lessons of the newer system called Omega. Uh, and again, if you're really interested, I'd highly recommend reading the paper on Omega uh, as well. It's a really very interesting scheduler. Um, lots of portability. And it's all about thinking about your application. The idea here is not to think about your servers. Up until now, everyone's always been thinking about their server. And has anyone heard the server, the cat versus pet, or, uh, sorry, uh, the cat, uh, get it right. Um, the, the, the idea that you've got one, effectively, lots and lots of servers. Um, and rather than actually thinking about them as pets, there you go, came out eventually, um, you actually think about them as, ca uh, as cattle. Because actually, it doesn't really matter about these servers. They kind of come up, come down. But actually, what we really want is something over the top of them that can actually manage it for us. So this is actually a popular, you know, really quite popular analogy at the moment. So what we're thinking about here is managing applications and not servers. And we're not thinking about what sits under the bonnet. Actually, all we're interested in is, this is my application. I want it to scale, and I want it to be resilient. Go do it. You know? uh, and that's pr pretty much how it looks. So this is kind of moving fast, really, really fast. Um, it's production ready at 1.0. This is what I'm going to be using today. Um, on GitHub, it's one of the most popular projects in the moment. Um, probably competes with the Linux kernel, I should think. Um, 11,000 stars, 1,000 people watching this. There's 530 people contributing from across the industry. You've got a lot of people. You've got a team of probably about 50 or 60, maybe more people at Google working on this solely. Um, and you've also got people from Red Hat. You've got people from absolutely all over. It's a very awesome project. 20,000 commits. I, I did this not long ago. It was 18,000, so literally in weeks, you know, there's, there's several thousand commits. And 1.1 is incoming very, very shortly. And we're pretty excited by that because we've, we've made a cool contribution to it. And our feature will be in there um, as well, which is pretty awesome. So what, is, what does it look like? Well, effectively what we have are these kind of oceans of user containers. And we have a Kubernetes master. I'll talk more about this. And a bunch of nodes. And these containers all get taken and scheduled onto the node. 
the magic happens in the master, and the magic, a lot of magic happens in the nodes as well. It's all about telling the system what my desired state is. That this is my application. This is what I want it to look like. I want to make sure I've got an application running. I maybe got five instances, and I want to make sure they're in particular zones and particular regions. And I want you to ensure that that state always exists. Go do the work to make sure that it happens, and don't get me out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. I don't want that. I want you to actually do it for me. And this is the Google experience. They have high, high levels of automation that mean that they actually can manage thousands of servers with very, very few people indeed. So, Cat, uh, oh, Cat's all, sorry. Um, that's a funny one, isn't it? I don't know why I've got them mixed up. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, cattle. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting analogy, actually. You know, this idea that you can sort of think about services cattle, and you can sort of take them out and shoot them, which I think is a particularly awful uh, <laughs> uh, analogy, to be honest. I wish I could come up with something a bit more friendly. Um, but effectively, that's it. So what's kind of nice, though, is that everything is proactively monitored, scaled, auto-healed, updated. We'll, we'll kind of see this um, in some detail. Cool. Okay, so some of the core primitives, or uh, as one of the guys at Red Hat calls it, the subatomic particles uh, of Kubernetes it, are, are these things. And I'm going to talk about, am I going to talk about, yeah, I'm going to talk about all of these today. I hope, um, we'll see how time goes. Um, so effectively, I'm going to try and describe them, but they, this is, these are the things you need to know. So if you're starting out and you really want to try and use this, get your head around these things. And everything else actually becomes quite straightforward thereafter. Nodes, pods, replication controllers, labels, services, volumes. Some of it will be... Um, Hopefully easy to understand. So really, at a high level, what does it look like? Well, we've actually just got a, effectively a master and a, and a set of nodes, and also clients, effectively. So what we've got in the master, in this is Kubernetes control plane, is we've got an API server. So we can talk to our cluster manager using an, a REST API. It's all backed by etcd. Who has used etcd? A few people. Um, cool. Yeah, so effectively, it's a distributed configuration with... Strong consistency, this is all about being able to guarantee that your data is available. So it's often a good way of putting a very sensitive configuration that you want to distribute. Uh, so it's all backed by etcd. Um, we've got a scheduler owner controller. I'll talk, I'll talk a bit more about this as, as we kind of go, go through this. But what I want to focus on first is this first uh, primitive, which is, or at least first component anyway, which is called a node. This effectively is a machine that's going to host our containers. And it doesn't matter what it looks like. It could be a physical host. It could be a virtual host. It doesn't matter. It's just a machine. In the case of some of the demos today, it's going to be my laptop. And we might also try doing it out on Core OS as well. But effectively, it's just a machine. And it runs a bunch of components, as you can probably see. It runs Docker. Um, that's that big whale. Um, there, it runs Docker. It doesn't have to run Docker. It's actually agnostic of the container runtime that it uses. So it could use Rocket. Anyone heard of Rocket? Yeah, that's a pretty great technology that's, that's incoming. Um, so you could eventually use Rocket in that place. It doesn't really matter. Eventually, you might even be able to use other OSs than Linux. This is all totally agnostic. It's been built in such a way that you can sort of rip things out and replace them with something else instead. So effectively, we've got Docker. Now, Docker runs, as you know, containers. We're going to talk about how it actually runs something called a pod, which is a Kubernetes concept. I'll talk more about this on, on the next slide. But importantly, one of the, we've got the Docker, we've got something called the kubelet. So this is a Kubernetes component that runs, that manages the pods. So effectively, it's responsible for talking to the Docker engine and saying, I've just had a request. I need to put this particular container on this node. Uh, go do it and give me the details uh, about the container so I can sort of wire it up effectively. Uh, and effectively, it's also got this thing called a kube proxy uh, as well. We'll get to this in a bit more detail, but this is about making sure that we can actually make these containers addressable, uh, but also uh, readable as well. OK, so what does a pod look like? What is a pod? Uh, well, a pod effectively is one or more containers. Think of peas in a pod, uh, effectively. Uh, I think it's also, isn't it, a collection of whales, maybe, in a pod? Is that right? Yeah, that's it. Um, it works on many levels. Um, so you've got one, one or more. Now, traditionally, in a container, you really just have one process. That's, that's the kind of best practice, that you don't sort of take a container and then load it up with like tens of processes. That's not the idea. The idea is that you take a process, user space process, uh, you put it into a container and you run it and you isolate it from another process. Um, the pod enables you to actually co-locate groups of containers. And there's actually a good reason why you, why you might want to do this. 
So what I've got an example of here is running a web component. We'll, we'll kind of go into a bit more detail what that might look like. But let's say maybe, I mean, maybe in an Nginx um, web server. If we wanted to actually take some code from Git, we might actually want to run this in a, another container in the same pod. The nice thing is that in a pod, we get shared volumes. So the volumes are shared by both containers. And also, we get the ability to uh, talk to the containers because we have shared namespaces. So we have network namespaces, IPC namespaces, so we can do things like shared memory. Um, and also share local host, of course. So it's really easy. So you can sort of start to just talk really easily between these two containers. Um, and they're isolated and they, uh, in, the, in the good way that they should be. But they also are co-located. That means that if I was to take these two containers, they're always going to be scheduled together. And we get that guarantee. We also get the guarantee that they live and die together uh, as well. Again, these are all kind of useful, uh, useful models. So a couple of examples for what you might do. Yeah, Git syncs one for pulling data. You might also want to do data pushing. You might want to take some data and push it somewhere else. You might want to do some clever proxying as well. So you could run a proxy in a local host and then proxy somewhere else. Uh, has anyone heard of the sidecar container? <coughs> or the ambassador pattern, lots of ideas about yeah, anyway, how you can uh, do, do these things. So I've got local volumes which I can run on the host, and I can also have remote volumes as well. And actually, this is where some of the work that Cluster HQ come into play, where you can take a remote volume, say something like an EBS volume, for instance, and then you can attach it to your container. Uh, and importantly, you can uh, move it with the container. We'll talk more about that uh, when we get there. So OK, what does... Um, it was a pod like, well, what I've done is I've, um, actually a long time ago, I built this thing called MyCMS. It's just a really small demo app uh, based on MongoDB. It's like a, like a content management system, I guess, uh, built in Python, uses Flask. Uh, you can deploy it using Junicorn. Something just really, really small just to demonstrate Mongo. But I thought, well, how about I just take that and I dockerize it, and I want to run this in Kubernetes. How could I do this? Well, effectively, what I've done is I've built a, built a uh, Docker image. So you can, uh, you can go and download that if you fancy. It's not all that great, um, but if you, <laughs> if you want to use it, you can. Um, but effectively, it's, it's actually a reasonably large image, which I'm pretty unhappy about. It's, it's kind of by like 700 or 800 megabytes. It's, it depends on our dependencies. Um, some of the things that you'll see today, anyone using Go, Golang? Go? Yeah, there's, a, there's another talk going on. Really, really good way of getting very, very small containers, because you can statically compile your application. Obviously, have to no dependencies and deploy it, so you can get it down much, much, much smaller. Anyway, we've got an image which is running a Python REST API. It sits on Mongo. Okay, really, really simple spec here. I'm using some YAML. You can use JSON as well. There's a JSON equivalent. But effectively, this is a, an object in Kubernetes uh, terms, and this is how I describe my application. It's really quite simple. Um, I'm using API version one. The object kind is, of course, of a pod. I give it a name, I give it a label. We'll see more about labels later, but effectively it's just a set of key value pairs which describe what this is. Uh, in this case, it's an, it's an app, clearly, uh, and it's also it's called my CMS API. And then I put a spec which says, look, okay, for that pod, this is exactly what I want to run inside it. I've got one container in this case, and that one container has a name, has an image, a Docker image, and it runs on the port, right? So this runs on 5,000 over TCP. Okay. So that's, that seems good. Um, if I can, I will, yeah, actually I'll flip out to the terminal in a minute. A um, bit more about labels, because labels are incredibly, incredibly useful. So in Kubernetes, everything can have a label, effectively. Every object can have this uh, set of key values attached to it. Um, and it's useful identifying um, attributes. So I can use it for all manner of reasons. So in my example, I was using it to identify the name of the application. And I can then use that again later when I wish to find it. It's a bit like a query, effectively. And that's sort of called label selection. And that label selection is used all over the place for finding these things again. So I can use them to group, and I can then use them to find them. And they're mutable, so I can change them over time. So I could potentially have a set of tags, if you like, or labels. And I can change them later. So in this example, what I've actually done is I said, well, how about I'm running two versions of my application, and I want to label it with, uh, with a version. So in this case, what I've actually done is additionally added a version. And I've got sort of two instances in my application. And I can label select. So I can have one service. We'll get to this. I can have one service look at one version of my API, and I can have one service look at the other version. Um, incredibly, incredibly useful. How does label selection work? Well, it's based on equality and sets as well. So you can do lots of things uh, around selection. OK, so I can run a pod. We'll see this. But actually, what I really want to do 
is run not one pod. I'd rather run multiple instances. Why? Because I just want to scale. I mean, I don't want to have just one version of my application. I'd much rather have, in my case, just a couple uh, of these things running. Good for HA, I've, you know, I've got at least a couple, uh, but also good for scaling as well. And I can sort of scale these things out as, as I need them. So the primitive that Kubernetes provides is this thing called a replication controller. And what it effectively does is ensures that the number of instances running and the types of instances running match my desired state. So I was saying just not long ago that I might want to tell it my desired state, which is I want to run two replicas. And I want to ensure, yeah, I want you to always ensure that happens. Well, that is what the controller does. The controller runs this kind of control loop, effectively, that says, how many have I got? It talks to the API server, and the API server sort of is the all-knowing truth. Um, how many have I got? Well, I've got, I've got two. That's good. I'm not going to do anything. If I've got one, then actually I need to go and do some more work, and I need to start one more. And it makes an instruction to the API server to say, do you know what? I need another, I need another pod, and this is what it needs to look like. Can you go and work with all of the nodes to, to, to actually go and achieve that? And it creates pods from a template. And the nice thing is, this deals with node failures. So if I was to lose an entire virtual machine, an entire bare metal server, then actually what would happen when it comes back up is it would just be rescheduled. <coughs> this is really neat. This is the thing that doesn't get you out of bed <laughs> at 3 o'clock in the morning, or even the paged. Um, pods being monitored and managed and selected by label selectors. So how does it do all of this? Well, it does it easily using label selection. And this is actually what we'll see. So here's some uh, examples. Well, here's an example even, sorry, of a replication controller. Another piece of YAML just about fits on the screen. Um, some of the examples do get quite lengthy, as you can probably imagine if you're running lots of containers. But now what I've got is I've got two versions of my REST API service so running, uh, replication controller, a couple of labels, name. And what you'll notice is I've now got a spec, which includes the number of replicas, together with a selector that says, I want you to go ahead and create um, a container which is based on that image. So, much the same, just with some additional, uh, additional code there for uh, setting up the controller. So, okay, that's kind of cool. So let's flick over, and wow, we're still working. That's a miracle. Um, well, we'll see, actually, shall we? <laughs> okay, can everyone see this? Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm running a local cluster of Kubernetes. And let's just see it's actually working, shall we? Cluster info. Good. Okay. So we've got a Kubernetes running, master running uh, at the local host. So the nice thing about this is that you can run it entirely locally. So I'm really using something called the Hypercube. Uh, it's effectively all of the components uh, of Kubernetes, the API server, the controller, the scheduler, etcd, all running as containers. So you can just use Docker. And that's pretty nice um, because it's really easy to start. It's pretty lightweight, as you can probably see. Here's a bunch of my, uh, here's a bunch of my Docker containers all, all running. I love some of the names that it gives. Have you seen some of these? It's just brilliant. Um, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it's all running these things, which is kind of all good. And, and then what I can do is I can use this thing called kubectl. It's like a sort of command line interface to talk to it. This is in turn talking to the API server to do all of these instructions for me. So I've got a local, ho I've got a local host version of this running. That's kind of all good. Um, have we got any pods? We have our Blue Peter style. So it did run a pod up front just, just to make sure it was working. So I'm actually running MongoDB server in the background here. So the latest release, MongoDB, which we all hope will work. Um, that's fine. So what I want to do is um, I'm going to talk you through actually loading some of these uh, actual YAML files. So what I want to do first is I'm going to basically run my, um, I've got a pod here, haven't I? Let's have a look. Yeah, I've just got my pod manifest. But what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to run it with uh, the replication controller. So let's go and find my right file, which is mycmsapirc.yaml. So this is the YAML that describes the API, uh, and importantly, it's the one that describes the replication controller. So I'm going to create it, and what's going to go on in the background? Well, let's look at the RC. So this, um, by the way, is a shortcut for just kind of getting the replication controllers. Uh, what does it say? Well, it says it's running this controller. It's got a container, it's got an image, and it's got a label selector. Has it actually done that, though? Should we, should we just double check? That looks reasonably healthy, actually. So what it's done, yeah, there we go, great, um, is it's now running two instances of the uh, CMS uh, API. So I can see that running, running, that's awesome. Um, that looks good. Wow, I've just seen the time. <laughs> 
I'm going to skip really, really quick. Um, <laughs> I'll come back maybe later today for the second part. Um, no, so we've got a bunch of pods. That's, that's, pr that's pretty awesome. So the nice thing is, what I can do is I can docker kill these things, and they can come back up. That's all good. Okay, let's get back over here. How, how does this kind of scheduling work? Well, effectively, um, it's taking all of my instances, my, my CMS, MongoDB as containers, and then it's then scheduling it into the right place. We don't, we don't concern ourselves with that. That's the hard problem that the scheduler does. Anyone heard of bin packing? The bin packing problem. Yeah, you know, effectively, I've got all these, you know, I've got these places I can put something. Where do I put it? Scheduling is a hard problem. I'm not going to talk about it now. With ten minutes to go. Um, so, uh, but effectively what it does, it does that, and it, we've got a scheduler which knows everything about the, the, the cluster, so it's, it's a shared state scheduler, meaning that it knows what's running, and it can make really kind of relatively smart decisions about where to put this. Um, it, does it, it, it does it using a couple of uh, ways, it does it basically based on predicates, so it says, okay, um, what rules have I got effectively that I need to first enforce, and then once I've met those predicates, how do I then sort of prioritise the, the nodes that match. And it does that by looking at resource utilization. The idea being that we want to spread these things nicely uh, across our cluster rather than just kind of load up uh, one node. This actually eventually will be pluggable, uh, which I think is really interesting. Uh, so you'll be able to take out the schedule and put something else in if you want. Cool. Okay, so how do we expose this as a service? This is kind of important because we've now got a pod that's running, um, but the pod isn't yet really accessible, or at least the fact is this can change. My nodes can fall off the planet. Uh, my pod may come back. My, my pod may come back somewhere else, potentially with a different IP address. So we need to be able to give it some stable identity um, that means that it's always addressable. So in Kubernetes, you've got this concept of a service. And this service enables you to expose it, um, giving it that sort of single identity. Uh, it uses label selection to actually target effectively the pods that it will direct the traffic to. And it does some very simple round robin uh, load balancing, so pretty simple stuff. And it also provides service discovery. This, this, this I think is very awesome, built in. If anyone's had to tackle service discovery, they know it's, it's actually not particularly easy. Lots of components are there, but you've got to kind of mishmash them together. It does this out of the box. Uh, and it does it in, in a variety of interesting ways. So what I want to do is I want to expose my API service uh, I don't want my two instances, and I really want them to appear as one, so that, again, they get load balanced. So what I'm going to do is create a really simple service here. Uh, and you know what, let's, let's just do it. Well, I had this like core OS demo running, but let's just, <laughs> we don't need to go there, do we? Um, good, but anyone who is interested can come, come and ask me about it. Um, OK, let's create this service then. So what I'm going to do is just cheat. Uh, oh, not my service, that's the wrong one. My CMS API set. Right, it's exactly the same YAML as you just saw. Uh, already exists, doesn't it? Really? Okay, it already exists. That's fine. Um, so I already created it. So I've actually already got this API service, um, and you'll notice it's got a label of its own. I can describe the service using labels, but it also has a selector which says, uh, okay, when I hit this service, what pods am I going to be directed at? And in this case, I'm saying, look, find any pod that matches the app. My CMS API, and it gets given this IP, and we're thinking, uh, this looks like an internal IP. How's how is this routable? Well, effectively, it is. This is a virtual IP. It's, it's not real. It just exists within the cluster. And um, well, this is uh, how services query works. So, effectively, I've got my service, which has a so-called virtual IP. And the virtual IP is baked into IP tables by the proxy on every single node. So when I actually go and actually create my service, what happens is the proxy will be listening on the API server for those services and the endpoints, and then update the proxy to say, do you know what, I've got this service, this service with this VIP is going to be running on a given port, and it's going to be proxied to the right place. So this does the work of updating my IP tables, that's cool, but then it also runs a local proxy, which is then able to send and route my request anywhere. What does this really mean? Sounds a mouthful. Um, it basically means that I, we can route from anywhere in the cluster. And I can do this um, in terms of networking. You'll notice we've got some local IPs. You can do this using sort of underlays or overlay networks to give it that IP for each pod. That's kind of nice. So what it means is that, well, a couple of ways I can service discover. Either I can go directly to the API server and say, give me this service, effectively, and it will give you the endpoints. That's OK if your client is able to talk rest. Most new clients will, of course, will. But that's okay. But how about, though, if you've got these sort of non-native 
legacy, dare I say, um, clients. Um, how, how might they talk? Well, we've got DNS baked in, so I can actually sort of have a, a, an actual stable DNS name for my service, you know, my, my CMS API service, dot x, 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 x. I can kind of set that. That's kind of cool. So I, if I was running uh, this other container, I could, I could use just DNS to talk to my <coughs> service. So I could talk to the API service, talk to the MongoDB service. Um, and the other way I can do it also, oops, uh, which I highlighted as well, is um, it's also baked in, uh, in, in each node. So you, you also get an environment variable built into each of the nodes and, in the and passed through to the containers, which gives you the host and port. So if you really want, you can use old school environment variables. Wow, they're really useful. Um, and you can actually, I use them quite a lot. So in your code, you could just refer to an environment variable and that environment variable will get updated all the time with the host and port. Again, all done for you by the sort of relative magic of this proxy um, and IP tables. Interestingly, um, yeah, interestingly, the proxy is, uh, Baked into IT, IP tables at the moment, but there's also user space a version of the shape just which they've done some. So a couple of different ways of doing it. Anyway, um, a couple of service types. Well, first one is we we expose this service internally. Um, we can also expose it on each node, and we can also load balance this. This is important because we can use things like ELBs. So we can actually make our service exposed outside of the cluster, not just inside the cluster. So we're God, looking at the time. Where does the time go? I guess that happens when you talk. Um, cool, okay, so let's run my service, which actually I'm already running, aren't I? Sorry. Yeah, they see, cool, and there's my, there's my IP. So let's try and contact this thing. Wow, that works. So there you go, um, there's version one of my application running uh, using the VIP. And actually, if you look at the IP tables, you can see the kind of magic happening. But what's nice now is that any one of my pods under the bonnet uh, can disappear. So I can pull the plug on the node, I can pull the plug in Docker can die, happens sometimes. Um, uh, but no, luckily, the container cluster manager is going to kind of handle all that for me. So, this all stop tour of pods, replication controller services. Um, we've also got volumes. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these slides online so you can all read them. Um, <laughs> um, volumes are important though, because eventually we need to be able to attach things that actually have state. And those, that state needs to move around. Um, we're actually working, let's say, with the guys at Cluster HQ on that. So they're actually attaching up to all these interesting uh, volumes, different types of volumes. And uh, we've just been working on a plugin uh, with them. But one of the things I was doing here was actually just using an empty directory on the host. So when I was writing data, it was actually going to an empty directory. But I could make it a network volume instead, which has persisted and kind of will live further. There's two really other cool things. How am I doing on time? Wow, really close to uh, having to go. <laughs> um, a couple of other things which I think are really interesting, and, and come and find me if you, if you like to see them. One is canary deployments. This, this happens a lot. Has anyone heard of canary deployment? Great, OK. So it's this kind of whole idea. Um, and if you want to read more about it, look, uh, look at the page by Martin Fowler. He seems to be the, um, <laughs> the oracle uh, of, of all sorts. So if, check it out. It's, it's really interesting. He will describe it. But effectively, it's this idea that you launch a new version of your application uh, to a small subset of users to test. Uh, you effectively send the canary out and check they, check they survive and come back. Um, so, and this is actually used a lot uh, by the likes of Google. Actually, Google describe how they make very small changes very, very regularly and push them out to a subset of users. So you might see a sort of small change to Gmail that gets pushed out to 1% of users. And they'll just double check that those 1% of users actually were able to still use their Gmail successfully. Um, and, and then once they're happy with that, they can just sort of begin to roll it out. So they might release that canary further uh, until they're absolutely happy that it's stable. Uh, and can be used everywhere. So this, this canary is really, really useful. I'm not going to show an example of it because clearly I've run out of time. But what you can do is you can actually release a new version of your application, which I did do. So I've got version 1.1, which changes the version number. So a very subtle change. No actual, no actual code changes other than the version. Um, but uh, it releases this canary. And what you do is you just launch it, a new replication controller. It says, look, I want you to go and create another version of my application. I want you to label it, and I want you to label it in the Canary track. I only just run one of those. And then you can sort of test that kind of works. No one's shouting at me yet. So does that mean I can keep continuing? No? Ten minutes. What? Ten, ten more minutes? Yeah, ten minutes of questions in. Oh, OK. It's not quite as bad as I thought. Yeah. OK. <laughs> So I will go back now. No, no, just. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Let's, let's do the canary. Let's, let's send out the canary. Okay, so um, what I want to do now 
is launch my new canary. And at one o'clock last night, this worked. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's see if it indeed works now today. Oh, wow. Well. Um. <clears throat> OK, so the canary's been released, as you probably see. I'm running just one version, but I'm running version 1.1 of my API. And then let's just see if the pods actually do exist. Does it, is it going to work? Is it going to work? Yes, it does. So you can see here the canary is gone. Well, is ready effectively. Um, there, there are really interesting um, liveness and readiness checks that you can do as well. So you can make sure that you don't expose your service until such time that the container is ready. You know, for, for instance, that it's instantiate everything that it needs to or connected to the database. Turns out, luckily, it did work. Okay, good. Um, so now, if I go back to my services, get se. Um, we've got a service here. Uh, I've got a service basically which talks to my API server. So it says that just match anything with that label. So what that means now is it's going to match both my canary pod and my non-canary pods. So I'm going to get sort of, if you like, you know, one third of my traffic. That's not quite right the way it going to work. But one third of my traffic, which is actually going to go to my canary. Um, so if we go and do my curl again. <sighs> that actually worked. <laughs> Normally we'll do a while loop, but um, <laughs> it's amazing it worked. <laughs> um, yeah, so it pulls it down. So I can sort of run this in production, uh, and I can just double check that all is good by having you know, lots of metrics, which I can use to just make sure things are good. OK, so next stage to this is, um, oops, that's my canary deployment. And this, this is actually where it comes to come fun, because you can say, OK, I've done the canary. That's all good. Um, let's roll this, because um, now this is something we actually want to roll out to everyone else. So you can do so, so a rolling upgrade uh, of it. So I can basically say, I've got this replication controller, which runs my old version, and I want to scale it down. So eventually, what I want to do is I don't want to have any instances of that, but I want to have two instances of my new version. So what it's got is a neat sort of uh, method, which is built into the cube controller. So this is all client-side driven, in order to do this for me. So I don't even need to worry about the mechanics of it. All I'm going to do is I'm going to run one line of code. I might be brave enough to run it, um, which is going to um, turn down one replication controller and turn up the other. And what it's going to be doing is it's going to be doing this every five seconds. Um, yeah, it's going to be doing this every five uh, seconds. So eventually, we'll lose one. Lose one, uh, lose one, gain one, lose one, gain one, and in fact, you get a kind of transition. So this is completely seamless. You know, you don't have to. There's no taking your service down, bringing it back up. This remains the same. Why? Because we've got this overarching <coughs> service which sits over the top with a, this stable identity. Um, so you might, might have an IP. You might have an ELB running. Typically, you probably would have an ELB running over the top of this, of course. Um, I'm just wondering if I've got the manifest for it. Oh, no, I haven't got the manifest for it actually. Um, but effectively, oh, good idea now, good idea now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've got time, I've got time, haven't I? Um, but anyway, whilst I'm doing this, I'm probably getting it wrong. Does anyone have any questions? So you're doing a rolling upgrade, and the new containers don't stay up for more than 12 seconds. Does Kubernetes notice that? Yeah, it has support for rollback. So if all, kind of, all goes completely pear-shaped, that you completely didn't anticipate, then yeah, it has, it has a rollback feature. Do you have to be monitoring it? Um, no, it's actively monitoring it. Yeah. And actually, th this is where the liveness and the readiness checks that I were talking about are really important, because you don't want to expose that container until such time that it actually lives. I mean, last night, as at 1 o'clock, you know, things, the things were coming up, <laughs> and then they were dying shortly afterwards, because what they were trying to do is connect to a MongoDB instance that didn't exist. Well. <laughs> We don't want to roll that into production until such time it's, it's all good. So you can build these methods um, into it, and you can have like a health checker, which is running to say, is the container ready? Um, both, uh, both is it ready and also is it live? Is it actually serving requests uh, as well? I would have squeezed that into the presentation, but there's, there's a lot to cover in Kubernetes. So um, yeah, have a, have a look at it. The docs are very, very, very good. Um, any other questions? Oops, oh, I skipped the other. Yep. Yeah, I think the latter. So yeah, you're f you're you're free to choose. So the great the great thing I think about Kubernetes is it acts a has a really quite extensive API. 
So you can sort of tap into it and use it in whatever way you want. Interestingly, the, the rolling update that you see here is actually almost just an example of what you can do. It's not the only way of doing a rolling upgrade. Because actually really what happens here is kubectl has baked in it the logic to do all of this. And it, it basically does all of the instructions that I was talking about. So it would kind of turn down. It would actually do a resize of the replication controller, which I've not done today. But I could issue just a resize that says, you know, can, you, can you make my replication controller go from two to five? And that's me telling the desired state to change. And it will then actually go and, go and enact it. So yeah, the rolling update is just one implementation. But you could, if you really wanted to, bake your own. You, know, you could do A-B testing. You could, I mean, you could do all sorts of things. And importantly, you could bake them into your own business process. Um, use metrics that you have. Maybe metrics which sit elsewhere. Yeah, it's kind of up to you. I mean, I haven't really shown monitoring today. but. You've got built into this um, something called Heapster, and um, so you can actually do container monitoring. So you can actually look at all of the metrics inside the container. Um, then you can sort of start to put that into something called InfluxDB, which is a time series database of doing metrics. This the and Grafana as well works in, inside here with the ELK stack. So you, you, you can you can do all sorts of clever things uh, and attach it. Yep. The um, what I understand the load balancer for the virtual IP is in the middle of all the north south and east west traffic. How do you how does Kubernetes avoid it? Um, it, well, it, it has, it, that's only the one form of load balancer that you can use internally is you can, if you wish, then use an external load balancer. So what typically people are doing are either using sort of cloud provided load balancers um, or actually taking something with a bit more enterprise and running that over the top. So you could, if you really wanted to, um, run something that you're already, you've already got. And a lot of people have already got load balancers built, yeah, built in, which are a lot more sophisticated in fairness. This is a relatively simple load balancer. It's just round robin based. Not going to be able to do anything too sophisticated. But yeah, you could plug it in externally. And the one way that you can do that oops, is using Node port. So what you can do is say, look, I've got this pod um, or set of pods. So I want to expose it as a service. And I want you to open a port on each node fixed, 32,000, for instance. And then you just have your load balancer, which sits over the top, that does load balancing to the node port, effectively. Um, what's coming in 1.1, which is really interesting, is um, a layer 7 HTTP load balancer. I think so. Anyway, we'll see if it makes it. But um, yeah, yeah, you'll be actually better to do much more yeah, content-based routing, which I think is what people really want to do, to be able to do path-based reading. OK, um, I'm going to probably summarize. We've just heard claps elsewhere. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, I think this is pretty awesome technology. Hopefully, you agree. Um, and you get, we're getting a chance to use it. It's kind of Google's experience, which they've just given to us for free. It's open source. Um, it's been written in Golang, so if you're really interested, go and look at the source code. You can actually see how all of this works. And uh, if you want, you can make contributions as well, as we are uh, at the moment. Um, this offers significant savings uh, in operational resource efficiency. So not only is it going to make it so much easier to manage things, you know, we don't have to manage all the myriad of sort of VMs that we would have in a microservice architecture. We just hand it over to something that does it very, very well. Um, it also has resource efficiency as well. We can take all those VMs that we're not using, and we hear this all the time. You know, I've got 10 VMs. I reckon maybe one or two of them are busy. The other eight are not really doing very much. OK, well, why not use a container? Why not use a scheduler that can make smart decisions about just putting things in the right places? And you could probably make a lot of savings on your AWS bill. Um, it's cloud agnostic, it's portable. The idea being that you could run this in AWS, you could run this in Google Cloud, you could run this in Azure, and you could actually just move your containers as and when you needed them. Yeah. AWS does go down, so it's kind of useful to have a backup. Um, it's probably, and it's ready-made. I, I love this. The, the very fact is, you can just download it, start using it. It's not the easiest install. I have, you know, it's getting easier, um, but uh, but it is ready-made, and, and there's so much that it's got a lot of this built in. So everything I've shown you today is not some like bell and whistle that you have to build yourself. It's actually baked into in, into it, and I think that's actually what separates it from a lot of other ways of doing this. You can do this clearly with other tools. There are lots of great things out there for doing service discovery, but um, you need to take all of those, mishmash them together, um, to get something. I, I like the fact that this is this is all here. It's very coherent, and uh, yep, got the hand. <laughs> and um, it's iterating in very very fast. So these guys are doing really awesome stuff, and they're doing it all the time. Um, anyway, anyway, that's me. Um, I work at Jetstack. Um, we've got a meetup group, so if you're ever in London, fancy coming along and learning out containers, there's hundreds of people who come along to it. So um, come along, meetup.com slash contain. Um, and we might be hiring. So uh, yeah, jetstack.io. So yeah, thank you.